Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and, and begin this session. Um, I first wanna apologize that for the um, abrupt discontinuation of the Q&A in the earlier session, that was a, uh, a technical error um, that I will take responsibility on. I was transitioning to the next session early and inadvertently um, the Q&A was cut off. So sorry about that and I don't think it will happen again. So now turning to this session, our keynote speaker session, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this year's VCBH conference on innovations in tobacco control and regulatory science to reduce cigarette smoking, Dr. Neil Benowitz. Neil is Professor Emeritus Active in the UCSF Department of Medicine's Clinical Pharmacology Program, Division of Cardiology, where he has been first as a fellow in clinical pharmacology and then as a faculty member since 1971, 50 years in, with that program, and he's been busy throughout. Neil did his undergraduate training at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York, uh, where he was actually a physics major, which I didn't know, it's fun to find out. And then he did his medical training at the University of Rochester in Rochester, New York, and then his residency at the Bronx Municipal Hospital Center, um, also obviously in New York, and then off to fellowship at UCSF. During his time at UCSF, Neil has gone on to establish himself as arguably the world's foremost expert on the clinical pharmacology of nicotine. I can tell you without question, when I have a question about the clinical pharmacology of, ni of nicotine, I turn to Neil's work, and I've done so many, many times throughout my career, and I've never come away disappointed. And when I share that personal <laughs> um, experience, I'm confident that the same is true for many of my colleagues in the audience today. Neil has um, simply outstanding academic cr uh, credentials, greater than 500 peer-reviewed articles, along with several hundred more reviews, editorials, et cetera. He's received numerous national and international scientific awards, ranks in the top 1% and higher in citations and impact in his field in web of science and other impact rating systems. He has been an active and central contributor, or I would, I would use the term a pioneer, to virtually all major tobacco control and regulatory efforts during the past 40 years, including many of um, the US Surgeon General's reports on smoking and health, including for me, the landmark 1988 report on nicotine addiction, um, where there were many collaborators. Jack Henningfield stands out in my mind. Uh, Jack and, and you'll have done many wonderful things together. But when, when you identified nic nicotine as the constituent in tobacco smoke that was driving repeated use and addiction, that, that was landmark, in my opinion. Neil's been a successful mentor formally for many and informally formal, for many others. And I, I could go on for a long time detailing Neil's accomplishments, but I think I can sum things up by saying he is as strong a model of the physician scholar as anyone could hope to see, simply outstanding across the board. So Neil, my sincere thanks for agree agreeing to be with us today in this role of keynote speaker. And I very much look forward to your lecture. Uh, the floor is all yours. Steve, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I actually found it hard to prepare this talk because you gave me the challenge of talking about innovations, which is a pretty broad topic. Mm -hmm. So I have to say, I, I took license to think about a variety of different approaches, some individual and some population. And so, um, and my focus is mostly from a pharmacologic perspective. So I, I hope you'll bear with me with my sort of flight across ideas. So let me start with a conflict of interest. I um, am a consultant to Achieve Life Sciences, a company that's developing cytosine. I'll be talking about cytosine just so you know in advance. Um, I'm not promoting or discussing any company or its products uh, in this talk. And I do serve as an expert witness in litigation against tobacco companies. Okay. 
Okay, so the first question is why are we still concerned about smoking and health? And I think um, if you live in certain areas of California, nobody smokes. Um, so you, you may wonder why are we so interested in smoking? And this is something that most of you know, but just want to bring a couple of issues up that I find interesting. First, there was an article recently talking about the major causes of death in the US in 2016. And this is a list, I won't go through them, but just to say that every single one of them is the risk is increased by cigarette smoking, all the 10 most common causes of death. Cigarette smoking in, in the US, well, I'm sure you all know, 14% of, of adults smoke, it's 34 million smokers. Smoking is probably relatively uncommon among your friends and colleagues. It's most common in people with lower education, lower income, LGBT, mental illness, substance use disorders. In San Francisco, the smoking prevalence is well under 10%. It's really amazing. But San Francisco General Hospital, which is a community hospital or public hospital where I work, 25 to 30% of our patients smoke. You all know this number, almost half a million premature deaths annually, and lifelong smoking costs 10 years. So th this is why we're all doing this work. And the, the, another issue which is important is getting smokers to quit as soon as possible is essential for public health. This is a diagram that um, Jack Henningfield and John Slade um, uh, published in the year 1998, which I think is really important. So this gives projections of cumulative deaths from cigarette smoking from 2000 to 2050. The yellow line would be if nothing was changed. The dash line on the top is if you prevent youth smoking, which has been a major issue, a major target of tobacco control and absolutely important. But you can see the benefit does not, um, is not seen for 30 years. To make a dent in what's going to happen in the next 50 years, we have to get people to quit smoking, and that's the bottom dash line. Well, um, smoking cessation, we certainly spend a lot of time doing it, but um, despite interest in it, uh, and the fact that smokers want to quit smoking, the rates have not really improved for 15 years. This is, these are data from BAB and the CDC that I think are very interesting. Um, these show data from National Health Interview Survey from 2000, 2005, 2010, 2015. Consistently, 70% of smokers want to quit smoking. More than 50% made an attempt in the last year of a day or more, or more than a day, hoping to quit smoking. 80% of those failed. So only 7% have quit smoking per year. And this has not changed for 20 years. Um, most, the majority get advice from, uh, to quit from health professionals, but 30% use counseling or any kind of intervention. Um, most quit, quit on their own. And uh, as you heard in the previous session, and I'll make some, some comments later on, uh, we're not, the tobacco control community is not really reaching most of the smokers who are trying to quit. And the question is, can that be changed? So I am gonna be talking about individual smoking cessation um, interventions, but with, with the caveat that we're not reaching most people with those interventions. So these are the topics I'll cover. I'll, I'll cover some innovations in individual smoking cessation. I'll talk about some nicotine neurobiology translation and precision medicine. I'll talk about a few emerging medications and an approach to pharmacotherapy that I think is important. And then I want to talk about the sort of population smoking cessation. So the end game issues. I'll talk about third hand smoke, which I'm doing research on, nicotine reduction, and, and then the whole question of cigarette harm reduction. So let's start with innovations in smoking cessation at the individual level. Nicotine neurobiology translation. So first, this is something that I'm sure you, you all recognize. Um, nicotine drives addictive combusted tobacco use Combusted tobacco use drives the eight to 10 million deaths annually in the world. Um, 
Nicotine itself is not harmful, but certainly much less harmful than combusted tobacco use. So the, our goal is to get rid of combusted tobacco use. Nicotine, as some um, you probably know, is a small molecule that's got structural similarities to acetylcholine, which is the most prevalent neurotransmitter in our bodies. And nicotine binds to receptors meant for acetylcholine. And it, it acts on virtually every organ system in the body. Um, here's a slide that's just a cartoon of a nicotinic receptor. So the, 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 the receptor crosses a membrane, it's a channel. Nicotine or acetylcholine binds to the outside. The receptor opens, calcium or sodium ions enter, and then they act on, on, on other um, cells. The neuronal type of receptor where nicotine causes addiction is uh, with five subunits, alpha four, beta two. They are, are the, the ones that are predominant. But there are also other subunits that can be there, namely alpha-5 and alpha-6. I'll talk about alpha-5 because alpha-5 receptor, when that's present, uh, that, that moderates sensitivity <clears throat> to the aversive effects of smoking. And as I mentioned, if you have a defect in alpha-5, you're less sensitive to the aversive effects and you smoke more or you can tolerate more. So that's one area I want to talk about in terms of, of neuroscience. The, the, this is a slide just showing when nicotine um, uh, opens the channel, it causes cells to release other neurotransmitters. And of course, dopamine is, is key to the reinforcement. I'm not gonna talk about that. A variety of neurotransmitters get released that do different things in terms of behavior. I'm gonna focus on a couple of drugs that work on the serotonin response, the serotonin system. And then finally, here's another slide that sort of puts the whole concept of, of self-administration of nicotine together. You have a product, you have environmental influences, you smoke, you get nicotine in your body, you get a variety of effects that you find rewarding. And a smoker day to day takes in about the same amount of nicotine if they're not constrained. So nicotine metabolism is important because for any given amount of nicotine, the rate of metabolism influences how much nicotine you have in your body. So you're a fast metabolizer, you want certain effects, you have to smoke more. And, and so that, that, that's the other um, uh, neurobiology concept we'll talk about. So here are the, are, are, uh, the, the two neurobiology translation issues, which are genetic variation. Um, as they might influence smoke cessation. So the CYP2A6 gene, which is genetically polymorphic, regulates nicotine metabolism. What we know is that more rapid nicotine metabolism is associated with more cigarette smoke per day and higher lung cancer risk and other diseases as well. Nicotine metabolite ratio, which is the ratio of two nicotine metabolites, hydroxycotinine and cotinine, this is a surrogate marker measurable in smokers. It's also a genetic risk score. So you can look at a person's genes for the 2A6 gene, and you can develop a genetic risk score. I'll show you data on that. In summary of the main findings, slow metabolizers we respond well to nicotine fat uh, patch, but fast metabolizers do not. And fast metabolizers need renicline or more or other pharmacotherapy regimens. For the alpha-5 receptor gene, um, there is one allele which is associated with reduced activity, which increases the risk of tobacco dependence by 30 to 50%. It's associated with heaviness of smoking and the risk of lung cancer and COPD. The alpha-5 nicotinic receptor in the medial uh, abendula mediates the adverse effects of nicotine. Mice with the alpha-5 knockout self-administer more nicotine. And this is a potential biomarker to signal the need for more intense smoke cessation therapy. So these are our two key studies with respect to the nicotine metabolite ratio. So the first from Karen Larman's group in 2005, which was sort of the seminal study in this area. And the second was a recent one published, uh, uh, um, the, some of the same data sets, but led by Rachel Tyndale, which looked at a genetic risk score. Uh, here are the main Larman findings. Uh, the main finding is that slow metabolizers uh, respond well to nicotine patch, normal metabolizers do not. 
if you just look at the left two panels, um, so this looks at uh, the quit rate at the end of treatment on, on medication. The left three panels are stomach metabolizers. The next three panels are normal metabolizers. The lightest box are placebo, and nicotine patch, and renicline. You see, if you're a slow metabolizer, you do um, just as well on nicotine patch as you do with, with renicline. If you're a normal metabolizer, and slow metabolizer here is the slowest um, quartile. Normal metabolizers don't respond to nicotine patch at all over placebo, but they do respond to, to, to renicline. And the same pattern is seen over, over other follow-ups. Um, here's a recent trial that is looking at this genetic uh, risk score with a caveat that because there are racial differences in genetic profiles, um, this is an ancestry specific um, risk score. So it's looking at genes that um, control 2A6 activity by, by race. And, and you can see basically the left reproduces the NMR data that, that, that we talked about. And the right shows the data um, looking at this genetic risk score, basically showing exactly the same thing. If you, if you have a, a slow risk score, you, you, you can predict response nicotine patches being as good as renicline. And if you're normal, your, your renicline response is much better. So it seems pretty clear that, that the rate of metabolism can affect smoking. The caveats are one is that this study looked at nicotine patch and not combined NRT, which is what we commonly use. Um, the, and the other thing is that the tests are not widely uh, available in the community. And a third thing is someone might say, why not just treat everyone with forensically? So this is, this is one area of personalized medicine. With respect to the alpha-5 receptor, um, a paper was published last year from Laura Bayrouch's uh, group um, that looked at genetic variation in, in, in the um, in alpha-5 receptor a response to vernically versus combined NRT in a randomized placebo controlled trial. This time might be a little bit hard to, to see. It comes from the journal, but they uh, broke out their analysis by people with European ancestry and then and, and African Americans. Uh, the blue shows placebo response, the green combined NRT, orange vernically. And um, in general, on, on the top, you, you see that the response uh, to, to European ancestry smokers to smoke cessation is greater than African-American in general. We see that in a variety of studies. I won't talk about that. That's an interesting question. Um, on the left panel, you see basically that uh, in, and, and the, the GG um, gene is the normal wild type and the GAAA are the people with reduced alpha-5 activity. So for European Americans, the alpha-5 gene does not make a big difference, uh, actually, in response. For the, uh, for the uh, African Americans, it turns out that the people with the reduced activity alpha-5 look like the fast metabolizers. So, so there's very poor response to nicotine patch, but vernicline works well. So, so again, these are approaches that could be used to individual high smoke cessation therapy. This test also is not widely available. So I bring this up because the science is interesting, but I'm not sure it's gonna make a big difference in our smoking cessation overall. So let me talk about some emerging smoking cessation therapies. And these are ones that I thought was interesting to me pharmacologically. So the first, well, the first one is cytosine. Um, cytosine, as you probably know, is a plant alkaloid. Um, it was, it's been smoked actually as a substitute for cigarettes for hundreds of thousands of years in, in various parts of the world. It, 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 it is a, an alpha-4 beta-2 partial agonist, so it's got vernicline type pharmacology. And several studies have shown that um, cytosine is as effective as NRT in smoking cessation. I wanna talk about a recent study that was just published in JAMA this year that was the first study to compare cytosine to varenicline in the randomized clinical trial. So this was a study that was done in Australia. Um, it looked at uh, regular smokers, pretty heavy smokers. They look at 25 days of cytosine versus 12 weeks of varenicline. 
and, and, and in terms of future developments, this cytosine regimen doesn't really make a lot of sense. It, it starts with six pills a day, gradually reduces to one pill a day. And um, current studies are actually looking at, at other regimens that might work better. So 25 day cytosine versus 12 to 12 with renicline, quit line support only. They looked at continuous absence rates from one to six months. Um, and Renaclean was shown to be superior, although the, the absolute difference was only 1.6% in, in quit rates. Interestingly, though, there were many more frequent adverse events with Renaclean, abnormal dreams and nausea. Um, which, which, and those are um, not uncommonly problems that make patients stop, stop using Renaclean. So this is a potential benefit of, of cytosine. Now, limitations of this study is that other cytosine dosing regimens that are being evaluated in clinical trials now appear to be more effective. And also longer dosing than 25 days uh, might be better. And importantly, cytosine uh, in many parts of the world costs pennies. It, it, it's currently marketed in Eastern Europe, I think 16 countries. And, and this is really from a pharmacotherapy point of view could offer effective therapy at a very, very low cost to many more people. Okay, then let me switch and talk about serotonin acting drugs. So, so, so this is um, Lorcaserin, marketed as Belvic in 2012. So this is a serotonin 2C receptor agonist. Um, it's interesting because this decreases firing of dopamine neurons in the brain, which is um, how nicotine reinforces behavior. And in rat studies, decreases nicotine subadministration. But also, and the reason why it's marketed, this increases the pro opio melanocortin secretion, which is, which is a hormone involved in, in, in food and appetite and decreases uh, food intake. And so I, I said this was marketed as a weight loss medication and shown to improve glycemic control in diabetics. So there's one interesting small study that was published in, in, in Jed Rose's group um, for, uh, to look at, at locasterin for smoke cessation and weight gain. This was a small 12-week uh, uh, randomized trial. And what was found on the left is that the smoke cessation rates were um, at, at month three with a higher dose locasterin, which is the standard dose for weight control were substantially greater than placebo. <clears throat> so clearly this, <clears throat> this looks like it's got some smoke cessation benefit. On the right-hand side shows weight gain. So placebo and low-dose locasserin and the ones who quit smoking, um, they gain on average a kilo. In, in, in 10 weeks, locasserin group that quit smoking lost half a kilo. So for those people where you're concerned, we're people are concerned about gaining weight, and that's an impediment to their quitting smoking, I think this is an intriguing drug. Another intriguing drug, psilocybin. I'm sure you've heard a lot about this. This is a serotonin um, 2A receptor uh, agonist from the psilocybin genus mushroom. It's been used ritually for centuries. Uh, I'm going to ask mostly on serotonin 2A and 1A receptor. And various studies have shown that, that this um, drug ameliorates the negative affect state and, and, and can help to deal with stress. Um, it also enhances cognitive flexibility, the ability to deal with conflicting cognitive signals and reduces compulsivity. And as you probably know, there are numerous trials looking at uh, substance use disorders, PTSD, anxiety, and depressive disorders. So there's one interesting trial that came from the Olin Griffiths group. Um, it was a pilot study published in 2014, but it was quite interesting. The, um, so this was an open label trial. It just looked at 15 healthy smokers, mean of 19 cigarettes per day, 15 weeks, 15 weeks of therapy, um, but three psilocybin sessions. Um, one in week five after um, a lot of pre preliminary counseling okay, and two more sessions of week seven and 13. The target quit date was week five. 
as I said, it was preceded by uh, pre pre preparatory um, cognitive behavioral therapy sessions. And then they received daily phone calls for two weeks. The sessions are interesting. So these are uh, pretty intensive sessions. Person's lying on the couch, there's a mask over their eyes, music through the headphones, lavender smell in the room. Instructed to focus on internal experience. <clears throat> Someone's there to provide interpersonal support for these four subjective effects and, 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 and then motivational statements prior to and guided imagery after the, the sessions. So it's pretty intensive that there's medical backup in case there are problems, the, the, the doses are well controlled. Um, so this, is, this may not be widely practical. Um, the results were, were, were pretty interesting. 80% um, point prevalence absence in six months, 67% at 12 months. So those are pretty high rates. There were adverse effects, so it, it requires monitoring. Blood pressure goes up with this drug, heart rate goes up. There can be dysphoric effects, fear, fear of insanity, which requires counseling online. Headaches can occur. The reasons for quitting were pretty interesting. They basically, people said this, this treatment changed my orientation toward my future life, it increased my ability to quit and change my life priorities and values. The, the right shows your, your encoding in, in terms of validating quitting. The, the left panels are treatment failures. There, were, there was some reduction of cotinine, but on the right were the, the total samples. You can see cotinine levels confirmed to treatment at the end of the follow up. So I think that this is a fascinating treatment to me, um, but pretty uh, uh, user intense or, or intensive in the medical care system. Um, let me go on and talk a little bit about approaches to pharmacotherapy. And this is one that appeals to me as a clinician who sees smokers, all of whom want to quit smoking, many of whom say, I just can't. So this is pre-cessation pharmacotherapy. So again, many smokers would like to quit smoking, but are not prepared to set a date. Um, and so the concept of this is starting pharmacotherapy before quitting with the expectation that quitting will be easier at a later date. And trials have shown that pre-cessation nicotine patch and vraniclean reduce cigarette nicotine reward and promote quitting over time. For the patch, we think reward goes down because uh, nicotine patches uh, desensitize nicotinic receptors. So they're less responsive. And, and vraniclean, of course, as a partial agonist, blocks some of the effects of exogenous nicotine. And you know, in some programs, it, it can be coupled with gradual reduction of, of cigarettes per day, such as 50% at four weeks, 75% at eight weeks, and quit at 12 weeks. The attractive thing about this is that a clinician can approach every patient in this way, just as one would approach every patient with hypertension or high cholesterol with medications. And so there, there's, there's one trial I, I, I want to um, talk about, which I thought was fascinating. This is a study from Spain, the pulmonary clinics in Spain. Um, and this is the use of renaclean for more than 12 months in heavy chronic, in, in, in heavy chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, smokers, unmotivated quit. This is a challenging population, as you all know. These people have a hard time quitting. So they um, had, the study involved 30 smokers. Um, 65 were uh, approached, but in this study, they purchased their own Vrenaclean. 35 couldn't afford it. But in, in this group, they average 55 years old, 24 cigarettes per day, high dependence score. They published their own Vrenaclean. They were counseled uh, about Vrenaclean action. So saying that we think that this is gonna reduce your interest in smoking and it'll make it easier for you to quit, but no, there's no set quit date. And, um, they, they, they had visits at one to six week intervals, depending on part of the trial. Um, and then they looked at, uh, at the duration of, of, of renaclin. So in, in quitters, the average duration was four months, in, in not, not quitters, two months. Um, the quit rates were anomaly high, 18 days or 18 months after the, the, after the end of Brennan So these are people with no interest in quitting, but it was like 70%. And this slide basically shows the, um, the, the participants and how long they use Brennan 
So three months seem to be a cutoff. Those who use fewer than three months, uh, they all failed to quit. Um, a few used more than one three months and, and, and still failed to quit. Some people use Varenicline for 24 months. Um, you, can, you know, it's hard to see this, that this, the, um, the gray bar on top of the darker bar, it's a period of time when they quit smoking, but still use Varenicline. So the idea here, if, if they can get a 70% abstinence rate uh, 18 months after treatment in COPD patients with this kind of pre-cessation of pharmacotherapy, therapy, I think this really um, invites a lot more clinical research, in, um, you know, especially in, in, in really uh, um, high-risk patients. Okay, let, let me switch now from individual smoke cessation to the uh, population smoke cessation. Combusted tobacco end game. So, as, as I'm sure you know, the, the definition of the combustible tobacco end game is a strategy to eradicate or reduce to minimal levels the use of and disease caused by combustible tobacco products. That's the goal of all of us. So, let me just start with the, um, the general population approach now is really the world. Health organization and uh, empower approach. I just shown this. So it's monitoring tobacco use and prevention policies. It's protecting the public with clean air laws. And you say this has been amazingly effective. And this will, I'll talk more about this in just a minute. Offer cessation support. We'll talk, we've talked about that a lot. Mass media and package warnings. And then um, enforcing ad bans and promotions. And of course, taxation, which also works well. Like I say, um, indoor clean air laws have really um, had a huge impact on, on smoking cessation. Um, because if you can't smoke in your, in your workplace, you can't smoke in your home, it makes it hard to smoke. So an area that I've been really interested in, um, there's a um, California consortium on third-hand smoke, which I lead as a PI. Um, uh, we summarized data in 2016 on um, third-hand smoke evidence challenges in future directions if someone wants to read about third-hand smoke in general. So what is third-hand smoke? Well, second-hand smoke is the smoke that goes from the smoker directly to the non-smoker. Third-hand smoke is what goes indoor surfaces, attached to indoor surfaces, and then later on goes to a non-smoker. So 30 ant smoke really contaminates surfaces and provides a, a long lasting source of exposure to tobacco uh, smoke toxicants. So um, we, we define 30 ant smoke by three Rs. It's chemicals and cigarette smoke that remain on surfaces and dust that re-emit back to the gas phase and, and expose non-smokers and react with other chemicals in the environment to make new chemicals. So for example, uh, new carcinogens are generated in the air as smoke ages that are not present in the smoke itself. Our group has done a lot of animal studies uh, where you put rats in a cage with cloth that's been exposed to the smoke, showed that the rats absorb carcinogens, they develop oxidative stress, metabolic abnormalities and genotoxicity. So at least in, in, in animal models, there's no question that third end smoke can, can uh, be harmful. So with respect to the tobacco end game, um, uh, if there's a cost to polluting your environment, that's another incentive to stop smoking. So environments of high risk include housing, workplaces, hotels, rental cars. The vulnerable population that we like to protect are children who are crawling on the floor and eating dust and, uh, and lower income people, especially in, in multi-unit housing where um, often smoking has occurred in the past. And what, what we've been pushing for are mandatory disclosure policies. Uh, that means if, if you smoked in a house or a car, you, you have to, 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 to disclose that. Um, we're developing third-hand smoke contamination standards to evaluate and assess how much how um, contaminated an environment is. And then reading, remediation requirements to fix it. So if you can't sell your house or you can't sell your car, that's a in, in strong incentive not to smoke in your house or smoke in your car. And we think that this could really support the, the clean air perspective. 
And if someone wants to, wants to know more about it, here is our website. It's, ho it, it, it's hosted at, at, at San Diego State University. And we handle lots of calls, both from health professionals and also lay people who want to know, what can I do about 30 and smoke? Okay. So the final part of my talk is nicotine pharmacology and public policy. So again, to go back to this slide, um, nicotine drives um, addictive uh, combusted tobacco use. And so we can develop a policy that uh, centers on, on nicotine related issues. And as you all know, Scott Godley and Mitch Seller published in the England Journal of Medicine in 2016, this nicotine focused framework for public health. This was discussed in this morning's panel, this concept um, uh, already. The concept is really this continuum of risk so that the riskiest product are combusted products in the upper right, the least ones, least toxic and also least appealing are the NRT products in the bottom left. And then you have products um, like smokeless tobacco, like, like e-cigarettes, which are more toxic and also more, more appealing and more acceptable. And, and so the question is, you know, um, can we just move people from higher risk products to lower risk products? So this issue is one that uh, everyone in, in, in schools and working on. Um, Steve in the Vermont group has, has been doing a lot of work on this question about reducing nicotine content. Uh, Eric Donnie will talk about this later. I'll just make a few comments. So the, the, the first was the proposal that Jack Henfield and, and, and I had uh, about 1994. And the background of this is that he and I were um, talking to David Kessler, the head of the FDA, when the tobacco company documents came out. And those documents basically said that we know there's a threshold of nicotine that supports uh, regular use of cigarettes. And, and, and so at that time, uh, Kessler was talking about FDA regulation. And so we said, well, if there's a threshold to support regular use, then we should use that threshold as a potential way to regulate um, tobacco. So the goal at that time was to prevent nicotine addiction in youth. This was youth focused. Um, and we estimated what an addiction threshold would be, say five milligrams per day. And so if someone were to smoke a, a, a pack a day, it would be around 0.4 milligrams per cigarette. And at that time, we proposed gradual reduction in nicotine content of cigarettes over 10 to 15 years. So the, the, the idea would be to look at nicotine availability, reduce it in cigarettes, uh, make clean nicotine available, and then after a period of time, someone could stay on clean nicotine if they wanted to, or quick clean, quick clean nicotine. So this was a general concept. I'm, I'm not sure we need this gradual reduction. You know, I think our will, will probably talk about this, that the rapid reduction works pretty well as well. Again, to, just to recap the main findings of sort of the first seminal study, large study uh, that Eric Donnie published um, on reduced nicotine content cigarettes, basically it found that the threshold to reduce nicotine addictiveness was about 0.4 milligrams per gram of tobacco, similar to what Jack and I uh, projected in 1994. Um, when people were switched, it reduced their nicotine intake, intake by 70%, reduced number of cigarettes smoked per day, reduced dependence and urges, increased quit attempts, resulted in no compensatory uh, smoking, and did not lead to greater use of substance of abuse or increase in depressed mood. And the, the slides here, both on the top, just shows reduction of nicotine um, levels as, as measured by urine nicotine equivalents. And basically, the, the, the lowest one is a 0.4 milligram. Um, ones on the top are usual brand or the, the high nicotine research cigarette. And the bottom shows cigarettes per day, showing that if you moderately reduce nicotine levels, people smoke more to try to compensate because they can. But if you market the reduced levels, they just can't, and they start smoking less. And here's some quotes from one of my studies, uh, a smaller study, but this, this I think really shows what we, what we hope will happen. So one person said, I no longer feel the need to have coffee and cigarettes first thing in the morning. I'm experiencing less craving. Smoking these cigarettes are like quitting, and therefore I just might as well quit, and smoking is losing its pleasure. So this is what we hope will happen to smoking as nicotine reduction occurs. 
And again, as you know, in 2017, the FDA promulgated this um, advanced notice of proposed rulemaking for a tobacco product standard for nicotine levels of combustion cigarettes. Numerous comments were submitted. Um, not sure where this is uh, in terms of FDA action. So what are some of the challenges to the nicotine reduction uh, policy? Well, one, to my reading at least, nicotine reduction appears to be safe and likely to markedly reduce smoking prevalence. Uh, it's undoubted that tobacco company litigation will argue that reducing nicotine levels to non-addictive levels alters the essence of a cigarette, therefore it's not a cigarette. This is something that has to be dealt with in the courts. Others have argued that nicotine reduction violates personal autonomy and represents government overreach, which people are very sensitive about in our country now. So that's something which we have to deal with. Then there's also been concerns about suddenly depriving smokers, smokers of nicotine, resulting in severe withdrawal, aggravation, mental illness, and other harms. And, and research has been ongoing with this. But the question is, and I think that this is important, is to gain acceptance of smokers for nicotine reduction, some adjuncts to marriage dependence would really be important. So one is readily available nicotine replacement medications. These work, but they're not very appealing. Uh, Non-combustible nicotine products. Some people talk about smokers tobacco, some people talk about uh, pure nicotine pouches. And, and then finally, um, electronic nicotine delivery devices as important adjuncts to a nicotine reduction strategy. Uh, so in 2016, um, this paper that I published with Eric Donnie and Dorothy Hatsukami, which sort of talked about why these fit together, why nicotine reduction, e-cigarettes and cigarette end game um, go together. E-cigarettes you know about, I'm just use a slide always to say that e-cigarettes vary a lot. And this is important in terms of safety issues. Um, so there are ways to regulate e-cigarettes so that you can make them less harmful than they are, even though they are potentially harmful. ICOS is interesting. Uh, we don't see much ICOS in the US, um, but around the world, it's growing in many places. And I thought it interesting, uh, I'll talk about this later, that. Um, Phil Morris says that 30% of the worldwide profits now comes from ICOs. Pretty impressive. So one question is, will ENDS become a legitimate component of the U.S. tobacco control effort? And I want to, want to go to a paper that many of you have probably seen. It's one that Ken Warner led, published in American Journal of Public Health um, last month, I think on balancing considerations of the risks and benefits of e-cigarettes. And this was, was co-authored by 15 former SRNT presidents. Now, the, I have to say, this is not SRNT policy. I want to make that clear because there was people were upset about this. And many people in SRNT don't, don't, don't agree with this formulation. So this is just the personal opinion of 15 former SRNT presidents. So the debate is just out, out, outlined here. The opponents, say nicotine addiction in youth is an epidemic and this is, this is killing our youth. It's renormalizing smoking. It's harming the adolescent brain. It's got substantial health risks and there's questionable benefit for smoking cessation. Uh, I think you heard this morning that there, it's not true, there is good, good, good benefit. The proponents say this could promote smoke cessation. Vaping is far worse than smoking. Smoking among youth is declining rapidly. And this is an important adjunct to regulation. Um, I just, I paused because my connection was unstable. That smoking, that vaping does increase smoking cessation. This is showing some clinical trials, it's been shown, it's shown in population studies. And also the point is, is made that cigarette sales in the US have decreased more rapidly while vaping sales have increased. And that in some places uh, like in Minnesota, the cigarette tax, which reduced vaping actually increased adult smoking. The, the issue of vaping being uh, substantially less dangerous than, than smoking is sort of summarized here. Um, 
So clearly there are many more toxic chemicals in cigarette smoke. Um, among those toxic chemicals, cigarette smoke contains substantially larger quantities than any cigarettes. Biomarkers reflecting exposure to toxic substances are present at much higher levels in exclusive smokers versus vapors. Toxic exposures decrease markedly when smokers switch to e-cigarettes. Some studies of lung and vascular function suggest that when cigarette smokers switch to e-cigarettes, they improve. Um, and exclusive um, users of e-cigarettes were former smokers who report fewer respiratory symptoms than cigarette smokers and, and, and dual users. So I think this is true, but I should also say that um, I definitely do not think that vaping is benign. Uh, you're introducing substances in your lungs that are having potentially adverse effects. Numerous animal models talk about um, oxidative stress and inflammatory responses. Studies in my, in my group and others show that vaping can be associated with a chronic inflammatory response. So I, um, again, I agree totally that vaping is substantially less dangerous, but not risk-free. With respect to youth vaping, um, some of the main points, nicotine addiction, um, uh, well, there's concern about nicotine addiction among those who have never tried vaping. Um, there's concern about increased risk of trying smoking and renormalizing smoking. There's risk about harm to the developing adolescent brain. However, as I'll show you in a minute, as vaping has become more popular, smoking prevalence among youth has reached a record low. Um, I won't talk about the others very much, although the, the adolescent brain is concerned. I think the data are still unclear about that. So these are important data from the National Youth Tobacco Survey, basically showing a phenomenal decline in smoking rates among kids. These are the most encouraging data ever in tobacco control, 16% to 6% over 10 years. Vaping rates have gone up. They've gone down in 2020 to 2021, uh, but vaping has not, in not increased smoking prevalence. And among those who vape or kids who start vaping, there's still no evidence that I know of that they are more likely to become sustained, addicted, regular nicotine users um, as adults. So we'll, we'll have to see if vaping is just a fad or continues or what the risks are. But so far this I think is very encouraging that we're not killing our youth by uh, having vaping. An important part of this paper and something which, um, which, which I deal with in California is a social justice issue. So to the more privileged members of our society, today's smokers are nearly invisible. Many affluent Americans believe that the problem of smoking is nearly solved because no one near them smokes. Yet, as I said before, one in seven Americans still smoke and smoking accounts for a significant proportion of the large life expectancy difference between affluent and poor Americans. And vaping can help some of these people to quit. Um, so some of the challenges. Um, you heard a little bit about this this morning. What's the appropriate role of ends in tobacco control? Should this be a medicine or, or, or a consumer product? Actually, I, I think it should be both. I, um, making the medicine in the US though is, is expensive, it's difficult. You have to go through FDA as a drug. But I think physicians would like to have um, a relatively safe product that they could prescribe to their smokers uh, to help them quit smoking. As you know, most smokers don't seek uh, uh, treatment for the smoke, that they want to quit smoking themselves. And, and having cigarettes available as a consumer product could certainly be helpful for, for, for that population. Um, is long-term nicotine use without combusting tobacco acceptable in our society? Well, th this is highly debated. Um, some people think that anyone could use nicotine if it's only mildly um, harmful, because it's no more harmful than alcohol or marijuana, which I think is probably true. Um, and this is something that our society needs to debate. There's a challenge for FDA regulation of these cigarettes. Uh, two issues in particular are important that, that they're dealing with. One is flavor restrictions. So flavors clearly are important for youth when they, when they, they start vaping, but adults also like the flavors. Um, having them get away from tobacco seems to me to be a good idea because anything that reminds them of tobacco reminds them of cigarettes as an adult when you're trying to quit smoking. Nicotine limits in these cigarettes are a really interesting question because we know that high power devices um, generate more aerosol, expose the lung to more aerosol, generate more thermal degradation products and are more, more toxic. 
uh, high power devices allow you to use low nicotine liquids. Low power devices like the, the pod devices generate very little aerosol at lower temperatures, but with high nicotine concentrations. So if you, if you have a nicotine ceiling, then you intrinsically require higher power devices to get enough nicotine to match what you get from cigarette smoking. This is a, it is, is a tough uh, act of balance because on higher nicotine also in say pod devices could make pod devices more addictive for kids. So this is something FDA has got to deal with. Let me end up with this question, the tobacco company. So this was um, something I think was Euro News. Um, so Philip Morris says, cigarette sales could end in many countries within 10 to 15 years and we will help as long as we can market our um, ICOs and other ends devices. Now I am as distrustful of the tobacco industry as anybody. I've been involved in litigation against them for years. But this is something which, which, which has come often. What are the ethics about um, working with a tobacco company if they could guarantee that we could get rid of cigarette smoking? I, I just raise this as a question. I have no answer to that. So here, so to, just to summarize it in terms of the end game, these are my, my personal thoughts. I think reducing nicotine content of cigarettes will reduce the addictiveness of cigarettes. I think the result will be preventing children from becoming addicted smokers and giving uh, adult smokers greater freedom to stop when they decide to quit. I, I think immediate rather than gradual reduction is probably safest and more, most feasible. Um, with respect to ends, I think electronic cigarettes or other non-combusted tobacco products would provide an attractive alternative to conventional cigarettes and would likely enhance the public acceptance of nicotine reduction policy. I am personally skeptical that ENDS will outcompete cigarettes in general, but certainly could support harm reduction for many smokers. And um, there are possible long-term adverse health effects of ENDS, which has to be assessed. We don't really know. We have not seen end or vaping long enough to be able to tell whether it can cause lung or, or, or heart disease. Um, but I think it's safer than cigarettes, and there are concerns about gateway to smoking and primary nicotine addiction in youth. So let me just add, add with um, some simulations that have been done about the potential health effects of reducing nicotine levels in cigarettes. So Appleberg and CDC people um, did the, this analysis published in the journal to 2018. They, they did a simulation model from 2016 to 2100 a prediction that more than 33 million youth and young adults who would have become regular smokers would not start, and 5 million smokers would quit within one year, and 13 million within five years would quit. And then here was a statement from Tangs from a simulation 2005, um, predicting that smoking prevalence would likely decline to 5%, with a resultant gain of 137 million quality uh, adjusted life years over 50 years, and that policymakers would be hard pressed to identify another domestic public health intervention short of historical sanitation efforts that has offered this magnitude of benefit to the population. So thank you for allowing me to riff a little bit and happy to answer questions if I have time. Thank you, Neil. Yeah, we have uh, about five minutes. So uh, please send your questions in the Q&A. Um, line that's available at the bottom of your uh, <laughs> your face page or whatever you whatever the term is we have one in there uh neil but you've already addressed it was asking you to address the, your uh, thoughts about the potential of a nicotine reduction policy currently under consideration by the FDA and also in New Zealand. You haven't spoken about New Zealand. I don't know if you're staying up on what's going on there, but that is uh, the one question that's in the Q&A at this point. Well, I, I don't know enough of the details. If someone from New Zealand is, is on the Zoom, perhaps they they could. Um, and I know it's, it's exciting that they're thinking about doing that, but I'm not, I'm not sure where they are right now. Yeah. Other questions, comments? Well, Neil, I, I have a question. I've been thinking about the nicotine reduction policy of um, 
you know, to, if the FDA was to not go forward with that policy, would there be grounds to protest that it's, it's reckless in, in the form of an omission of an opportunity to protect against addiction and, and um, adverse health impacts, especially in vulnerable populations? So it's just a, a slightly different way of thinking about it. I think that is an interesting approach. There have been some lawsuits actually in that saying that uh, tobacco companies knew ways to make cigarettes less addictive and didn't do it by not lowering nicotine. I'm um, not sure how well they've done, uh, mm -hmm. but this would be a different approach. This would be like a, a social equity approach, mm -hmm. just like it's being done with menthol cigarettes. Correct, okay. yeah. So I, I think that'd be very interesting. Um, yeah, great. So we have a couple coming in now. I have one here from Jamie Tam. Can you comment on the Ill illicit market concerns that have been raised about VLNCs? Well, certainly there will be some illicit um, the tobacco products. Some will be imported from other countries. Um, people may try to get nicotine to uh, put in their cigarettes. So that's complicated and difficult to do. But you have to look at the fact that the vast majority of smokers actually would like to quit smoking. They would like to have an out. So there might be some illicit tobacco products, but I just cannot imagine that that would be very much of an issue uh, compared to the benefits of people quitting smoking. Like I said, in places like California, our, our quit rates are, are already below 10%. Uh, you know, in many communities, no one's smoking. So most people would like to be non-smokers, I think. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I mean, so certainly it's got to be dealt with. It's got to be considered, but I don't think it's going to be a major issue. Yeah, great. Then we have one here is, why don't we see more RCTs in the U.S. on novel nicotine products? This morning, we heard about the Cochrane Review and almost all RCTs, um, from come from abroad, which is unusual in research. Often the U.S. leads the way. Right. So this has been a complaint of mine for, for, for almost 10 years. In the U.S., you have to have um, approval in the Center um, for Drug Evaluation Research, CEDAR. You have to have an IND for the drug, which requires extensive uh, animal testing, safety testing, to get approval to do a trial which means that, um, and, and so far no one has, no e-cigarette manufacturer has managed to submit um, and, and get, get an IND. I think it's possible, but it'd be very expensive. Mm -hmm. I've argued, and others have, that um, since cigarette smoking is so harmful, and since there's such strong biological plausibility that e-cigarettes would be less harmful, it's, it's reasonable to give an exception to the usual drug application process to do trials to basically show if uh, and how e-cigarettes could promote smoking cessation. Um, we could have done these trials years ago and been be much further along in figuring out the benefits and risks of e-cigarettes. Um, right. FDA said that, that they're gonna try to develop an internal committee to look at nicotine issues, but I don't think they have any progress on this. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I'm encouraging that some e-cigarette companies should submit INDs and do proper clinical trials in the U.S. Wonderful, wonderful. Boy, that's a potential innovation <laughs> that was worth hearing about. Um, so then we have one more here that we can wrap up on. Would you advise for state tobacco programs to pursue nicotine reduction or wait for the federal FDA action? I believe it is within state authority to address nicotine levels in products. Yeah, I, I, um, I think that's true. That, that would be fascinating to do that. I, somehow I have the idea that um, this was proposed in some small communities somewhere. I'm not sure what, what would happen. Now, the, obviously, there are no products available. So basically, it'd be like banning cigarettes uh, because no one's marketing these. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think that that would be a very interesting idea. Yeah, it is an interesting idea. Well, I think that wraps up this session, Neil. Thank you so much for an outstanding presentation, very thought-provoking, 
very broad, which you know I, I wanted you to riff, and and you did it very effectively. So thanks very much. And so at this point, we transition to a one-hour lunch session, and so we'll resume at uh, 1.30. So thanks, enjoy your lunch, and see you all soon. Thanks, thanks. again, Neil. I'm gonna thanks, get off. Thanks, bye. Yeah, bye-bye.